next up we have a talk by Stephanie. Stephanie is a designer and a project manager with over 14 years of experience. She specializes in developer experience and tooling as well as the web platform. Um, she is a proud pet parent of Vogue who is a pom and is adorable. Uh, and together they have moved from Seattle all the way to England. Uh, also she's written a book called Design for Developers which I think a few of us could really use. Uh, <laughs> and now a PM at the web platform team. Uh, she loves mountain biking in her free time. Uh, without any further ado, please welcome Stephanie. Thanks everyone. I have the dreaded after lunch spot, so it's my job to try and keep you awake. Um, so yes, I'm a PM at Egalia, but my career has definitely been like living in the intersection of visual and UX design. Um, I dabble in code and user research. Um, I spent about six years on the Microsoft Edge team working on developer experience in the web platform. So some of the things I'm gonna say today are based off of that experience and what I saw. Um, I would like to give a quick shout out to Brian Cardell and Eric Meyer because a big chunk of this talk is based off um, an outline and a discussion that they had back in March of this year um, during W3C breakout sessions. So with that, um, today we're gonna dive into a very large and complex problem and talk about funding the web ecosystem for the future and how we can do so in a sustainable manner. So to start, I want you to imagine an ecosystem that provides a resource that is capable of generating massive amounts of wealth. People are constantly seeking this resource because of both the wealth it can provide and help create, and also because of its beneficial properties to humans. It provides tens of billions of dollars and it enriches those who control it. And instead of pouring the profits back into the ecosystem and into the infrastructure of this place where great wealth comes from, it instead goes on to fund other things and make corporations richer. Now, some of you might be thinking, like, why is she basically giving us a high-level overview of the subplot for Dune? And what does that have to do with the web platform? So if you're unfamiliar with Dune, there's a substance and resource called Spice. And it, it basically formed an essential block of commerce and technological development in the known universe in that story. So they say he who controls the Spice controls the universe but I'm not talking about spice, obviously. I'm talking about browsers and access to information. He who controls the browser controls the universe. And I don't think this is such a wild statement. We live in the information age that started in 1970. And the sub-period of that right now is the internet age. And information is the spice of our world and our access to seemingly never-ending supplies of information is gatekept through web browsers. And browsers are critical infrastructure to life as we know it. Um, and they're also extremely complex to maintain and keep healthy. There are over 5 billion internet users every single day, and that is over 67% of the global population and they use browsers, which are free, to do so. Now, this happens thanks to search royalties that fund browsers, kind of like an unofficial tax. Um, it makes sense to use search for this because search engines get most of their value from the web, so paying back helps keep the web thriving. Um, however, this creates a system and a cycle that has very many problems with it. So it pays for browsers, not engines. Um, smaller browsers don't get a cut of the deal, so the process to get a cut of the money is super unclear, um, and lots of smaller browsers miss out on that. So really don't know how to get a seat at the table. 
um, added search revenue doesn't all go back to web infrastructure. Again, I used to work on the Microsoft Edge team. That Bing revenue was not coming back to our team, at least not the platform team. Um, there were so many opportunities to, or there could have been so many opportunities to fund so much more work on the platform, but we just didn't get enough of a slice of that Bing revenue. Um, there's also legal and regulatory pressure. And then for me, um, they're owned by corporations. Like, this is a somewhat horrifying reality. Um, they're owned by large corporations. And why is that horrifying? Why am I using that term? Well, I tend to be an overthinker and a very anxious person. Um, I like to ask big questions like, what if? And when I was looking at what it means for a corporation to own something, my intrusive thoughts asked, what happens if those corporations disappear? Um, so if we look at the Chromium project, which is open source, um, who do you think does the primary maintenance of the browser of Chromium? It's Google. Overwhelmingly, they contribute the most amounts. Um, to Chromium every year. But when we look at how many browsers that we have that are based on Chromium, they are only providing a fraction of the work that Google is doing to maintain Chromium. So that's a lot of browsers, depending on Google, to just keep maintaining. So what happens again, worst case scenario, if Google disappears? Million dollar question. And you might say, hold up, you just said it's open source. It's not going to disappear. But just because something is open source doesn't mean it has the foundations to remain a sta stable and viable option. Um, open source doesn't really solve anything when there are cracks in the system that are already starting to show and being reported on. Google had 105,000 commits out of 110,000 total last year. Who is going to be paying for the very large void that would be left if Google disappeared? So open source needs sustainable funding, which it doesn't have. And the web, web ecosystem doesn't have a sustainable system in place to keep it going. Our current digital infrastructure is dependent on a system that is designed to take and take and take from what already exists um, without contributing back an amount that ensures that the future is stable. So what is our current system? We have a company with a web engine and a browser, and then they have a search engine to access information, aka Earth's Spice. And when you search, you're overwhelmed with ads in your search results. Um, if you click on those, someone gets paid. Um, typically, those ads bring in billions of dollars um, to the point that some companies will even, some companies with their own browser will pay other companies with browsers to use their search engine in their competitor's browser because they want that search, they want that money. So the company gets money, and ideally, you'd think you'd have a nice, even like split of where the money goes. It goes back into the company, and then hopefully a lot of it goes back into the web engine. But in reality, that is not what hap that, that's not what's happening. Web engines are getting just a trickle of money from the search revenue that only exists because of the web engine. And then the other aspect of this is the company that owns the browser and the web engine is going to push for features that benefit their company to be prioritized over the greater web development community's wants and needs. So they also steer the direction of the platform and the ecosystem. And I, again, I have seen this firsthand. Uh, typically, features that, that help drive up revenue are going to be prioritized over what's for the greater web development community is good. 
So the system to fund the web is currently broken and under a lot of pressure. It's just not sustainable the way it is. So how are we going to fix this? It's going to be really hard, um, because how do you get people to care about a problem that doesn't seem to be affecting them right this instant? Um, I have another sci-fi reference for you. Um, if you've seen the Netflix adaptation of Three Body Problem, how do you get people to care about something that will happen when they're long dead? It's really hard. And so I want to say this isn't going to be solved today or tomorrow or even next week. Like this is a huge conversation and undertaking to try and reform the system. So the goal of this is to start conversations now, uh, to start thinking about things before the system collapses because it's less catastrophic to fix things before it does. And again, you might be thinking, Steph, you're sounding a lot like a doomer when it comes to the internet and access to the web, talking about collapse and catastrophe. But am I, am I really? It's very hard to go throughout my day without relying on access to the web. I use the web, I use a browser for everything. Accessing my bank to pay my bills, my job is entirely dependent on the web platform. Um, I mean, when was the last time you used a physical phone book to look up a company's phone number or address? Who has used a paper map recently? What would happen if everyone lost access to their browser right now? What would that mean? So what do we need? We need money. <laughs> if we're just going to be blunt, the ecosystem needs money to ensure that our foundations for the web um, are continually being improved and stabilized on and that we're not relying on large corporations to be the gatekeepers of the web with their browsers. So how do we get it and how do we encourage the contribution of it? Um, I have a there's just a couple ideas. There's going to be a lot more that you guys may have, but these are just a couple, couple to get the conversation going. So donation-based systems that are voluntary or culture-based. So like if you're familiar with Open Collective, um, it could be something like that. Um, we could provide incentives for donating or working on web infrastructure like tax breaks so that there's some tangible benefit to contributing your time. Um, there's this idea of retroactive public goods funding, um, and this delivers incentives to public goods projects based on current impact rather than anticipated future work. So, for example, not startup culture where you get VC funding and you get funded with the expectation that your company is going to succeed and you'll get a return on your investment. This is about investing on actual impact. Um, we could even try and fix the current search and browser system to be a more effective tax that funds the work. And there are so many other ways that could potentially provide revenue to finance the web. And I mean, many more. Like, who wouldn't want to pay to watch merge conflicts get resolved live? Like, <laughs> this is an aptly timed comic that came across my Mastodon feed the other day. Um, so. It demonstrates the problem that not just the web ecosystem, but open source is facing. Like, how do we get funding? So this is the problem that we need to solve. So if we do try and reform the existing system, it needs to be mandatory. So we could start by using the opportunity given to us by the EU stepping in by lawsuits relating to search defaults or other such interventions to include this as part of the remedy. Another option is to get engines to introduce license terms that require participation from all parties that rely on their code. And then additionally, like we could use browser choice screens as leverage. So by restricting whether or not a browser shows up on those screens when you have to pick, what do I want to open this in? Because there are so many companies that 
do have the means to contribute in a very, very meaningful way, but they don't. And this is ultimately putting strain on the ecosystem. If everyone continues to take and take and take from the well, the flow of meaningful commits back into engines becomes a trickle compared to what they could be. And again, this just isn't sustainable. So if we want to fix this, first off, we're going to need a way to govern it all. Uh, we need a power structure that's credible. Um, especially if you're trying to get donations from people, you want people want to know where their money is going. Um, it needs to be accountable and be able to represent multiple interests. And we need governance that puts power back in the hands of the wider web community, not, co not corporations. Um, we know that there is a ton of collective experience in the group, in the community, um, in different standard spaces, um, and just, again, the general web development community. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. Like, the experience is there. We can make this happen. And then, along with governance, there's allocation. How are we going to distribute the funds? Um, we could have small funds for each work stream, so people pay into the funds they want to. So this is kind of like the open prioritization initiative that happened a couple years ago. Um, you could have one big fund and then democratize that process through votes. Um, we could also use telemetry to detect usage and distribute appropriately. So this is the product manager's dream. This is data-driven funding. <laughs> Um, you, we could also use impact evaluators or things like hypercerts that award based on positive impact. So hypercerts are a new token standard for rewarding and funding positive impact. And again, there are probably more ways to allocate funds that we're not even thinking about. So as with this entire conversation, anything is possible and we need to start somewhere. So let's start today. Our digital infrastructure should be solid and secure so that the future of the web can flourish and thrive. It's a huge undertaking. This isn't a small ask um, with many, many, many possible paths. And like I said, this isn't going to be fixed today, but we need to start somewhere. Um, so let's keep it going. Here are uh, just a few resources to start the conversation. Um, I will leave this up if you'd like to snap a photo so that you can participate. But <laughs> let's ensure that we're building a new system that can outlive us and sustain itself well into the future so that the information, just like the spice, can flow. Thank you. I have a question for the group because we have breakout session time available. Would anyone be interested in this becoming a breakout session for discussion? Okay. Uh, again, <laughs> can you show me your hands? Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> that was just to see I'm if sorry. people were interested in a breakout session tomorrow. <laughs> But um, as a concrete example, I, I love Servo, and I don't really have a clear idea about how Servo is, is being funded. Mm -hmm. I understand that Servo is hosted at the Linux Foundation, and I also understand that the Linux Foundation has a lot of money. Some of the Linux Foundation members are paying $500,000 annually, mm -hmm. and they're paying for something, but it's very unclear to me what they're paying for what value they see there. <coughs> and it's unclear to me where the money is going. They have a lot of money coming in. But looking around these days, that seems like a place where they've been somewhat successful at figuring out how to get money coming in. Mm -hmm. It's less clear, like I said, where it's going out to. But I can say from talking to, you know, I work for W3C, and part of my work uh, is trying to get companies to join and pay 
W3C fees to, you know, what we charge for a membership fee. And some of the feedback I get is they're not interested in funding standards work. They're, they want other people to do that work um, and pay the money to, to participate in working on it. But they are very interested and they do have budgets for funding <coughs> open source. And so they're looking actually, the companies in Japan at least, looking for opportunities to spend that money. And so that's a good thing. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know how much insight you have into that in particular about Servo and Linux Foundation. But um, I'm going to let Rego answer that because I, I have a, just a very vague sense. Yeah, I can, I can try to answer that. Uh, in the case of Servo, the funding uh, is from external companies, it's not from Linux Foundation directly. So basically, yeah, a Linux Foundation is like hosting the project and being an umbrella for the project, but it's not like providing funding for the Servo project at this point. I don't know if that was the case. However, there was a small, I mean like Linux Foundation projects can have a board and can have companies putting money there. Uh, but Servo is not that kind of project, doesn't have a board and doesn't have companies sponsoring the project. So for, com for projects that are in Linux Foundation, that companies set up this board and put money, they, I guess, get some money from them. I don't know how that works exactly, but yeah, it's not the case for, for Servo. Any more questions? Thanks, that was a great talk. I'm excited to talk more about it. Uh, one of the questions that I had was whether you knew of any corollaries or any similar industry or similar pattern like this in other industries. Like, are there other things that we could point at where uh, that greater good was funded by everybody mm -hmm. who is able to extract value from that well? Off the top of my head, I don't know. But Brian, do you know? Well, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let me narrow the scope a little then. In technology, as opposed to physical infrastructure, or like, like tech, yes, existing taxation systems are probably a, an easy example. No, somebody back there was saying something. I, I, I was just throwing out the words. I, I was just saying, like, GPS and GLONASS and. Like, they seem to be, I, I don't know any details about that, but they're like giant infrastructures that are funded by governments, I guess. That's all I had. So, uh, for, for better or worse, uh, related to, to what you're saying, an alternate funding structure besides corporations is like these GPS systems, militaries. And actually, they are funding increasingly open source software development when it's kind of security oriented. There's a lot of interest now in like open source supply chain security that's, I mean, driven in this, in this direction. Uh, I'm, I, <laughs> I wish we had an, another answer that's more along the lines of what, of what you're suggesting. But at the same time, we, as long as the, it's being used for good things, maybe it's okay, I'm not sure. Uh, I also separately wanted to ask, uh, given that there are many different kinds of software infrastructure that we all depend on, there's web browsers, but there's lots of other things, like XZ was th the big you know, thing everyone was talking about. Uh, you mentioned governance structure. How should the world like, <laughs> prioritize which things to work on and distribute among all those work streams? Well, let me go back to that, my governance slide. I think it's gonna, it's really gonna depend on the people that we allocate to govern things. And then if we wanna have a democratic process, it can be through, I mean, then it goes into the, the allocation thing. Like you can have people choose the work stream they want to, and that's pretty easy. Like for example, MathML, someone pays for that, and it's like, okay, we are gonna work on that because we had that funded. But then you sort of get into 
again, like one big fund, well, voting to make sure everyone sort of gets a, a voice. Um, and then trying to use data or like the, the impact evaluator and hypersert, that, which I didn't really know much about hyperserts. Well, I still don't, but just like what I have researched. Um, but those are interesting because the concept of like rewarding work that is that we know is going to benefit um, the greater good um, is not something that I've really seen before. So I really like those models, but then it becomes like, how do you choose which of those things gets that funding? But this is a, it's a conversation starter. I don't have an, like, I don't have a answer, um, but it's a good conversation to have. Uh, I have a, I guess, more of a comment than a question, mm -hmm. which is, like, I think it is a really interesting question. I also don't think it is in any way specific to open source. I think actually the question that you have posed us here is like, what should our economic system be? Should we overthrow capitalism? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm all for it, but I think it's, it's a difficult question, right? And it's one that our society has been struggling with since approximately the 70s when we decided to go towards capitalist uh, society and that we haven't really come up with a better solution yet. Um, but yeah, I guess I would s recommend, to, ooh, sorry, recommend to anyone who is interested in this to yeah, go and study economics. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make another, I think I have a moment to make a comment, like just about funding things. I know that there are individuals will pay for things that they want. Um, I, there was just a web component design system that raised three quarters of a million dollars to like help this team build this system. I think that's, you know, that's a lot of money that they <laughs> raised very quickly for essentially a design system. And I, I think it, it, there's this interesting problem that I again brought up like people want to pay for something that is immediately going to solve their problems so how do we sort of switch the narrative to talk about and get people to donate for things that they may not see an immediate impact or return but is going to fund and like stuff for humanity and the greater good in the long term, and how do we switch that com that conversation and get people to donate for that? So, any more questions? Okay. Uh, well, I could ask a question as well. Yep. Uh, talking about funding and like um, sort of fundraising in software, uh, I feel that web browsers are so important and incredibly complex, right? Why do you think it's harder to fundraise for a web browser than it is for a video game or something that maybe is not as complex? That's a really good question, and I don't know that I have a good answer, but I've never thought about it in that context. Because a web browser also provides entertainment, like it's how you get access to YouTube and streaming platforms, and. Um, I, I, part of me wonders if people have just sort of taken the internet for granted, like you've never had to pay for it. You, you get your computer with your operating system and well, you've got Edge automatically installed or you've got Safari and it's just, it's there. Yeah. Brian? So I, I think Stephanie's answer is like the essence of it is correct, except for you do pay for it, right? I mean, Microsoft is not giving you Windows for free. <laughs> correct. Right? Like they're making money, lots of money. Uh, so that, I mean, I think that's the answer is that we've, we have managed to trick ourselves, trick everyone into thinking that it's free, right? It's like, I, I use this example all the time. Like my grandmother, when I was a little kid, cable TV came out and we got like HBO, like, you know, commercial free, 
you know, and my grandmother was like, I can't believe somebody would pay money for a TV. It's free. Like, it's free. It just comes over the air. But, of course, like, if you watch commercial TV, it, it's not free, right? Like, you're the, you're the, you, they're paying for your eyeballs, you know? And if you look at the money that comes into the web platform through search today, like, everything is funded by tiny, tiny, tiny crumbs of that revenue. Like, there's so much money generated by the web platform. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's because we've managed to convince everyone that it's free by making them the product, you know? <laughs> yeah. And we've also sort of told this story that, um, you know, isn't completely untrue. I mean, Microsoft, Mozilla, Apple, Google, they have been like the champions of the web in a way, but, you know, also not because they're like the Avengers or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like it's, you know, there's, there's real reasons why they do it and their business reasons too. Maybe not the people that we know who are involved, that's not their motives, but you know, that's what funds the work, so. Yep. Thank you. Um, well, any more questions? No. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, thank for your talk. Thank you.